Hi, welcome back. I'm Bruce McConnell with Locomotive Systems Training and today we're going to talk about EMD theory of operation. What happens inside the engine with engine oil? It does things that you may not be aware of. Episode number six. Alright, first thing we do we're going to talk about the, the theory of operation. Now we're going to go over the parts because you got to understand what the parts are and what they do to get a better understanding of how this engine actually operates. So we're going to start over here we're going to start down, down here at the bottom. This is what they call the piston. Up above here is the liner air intake ports. And that's really, really important. We're going to talk about that a lot today. Uh, there, well, here they're showing two exhaust valves, but it's actually four on an EMD per cylinder head. We have an injector located right here in the middle of the top of the cylinder. We have two engine gear train. We have an overriding clutch right in here. We have a turbine wheel right here. We have an air inlet for the impeller. This whole area right here is called the turbocharger assembly. Then we have a water cooler outlet right here. We have an after cooler to cool the air as it comes from the turbo before it gets into the air box in the engine, the water inlet, and of course the air box right here. Now, so those are all the players in the game. Now, this is only one cylinder engine. We're looking at, you know, V12s, V16s, V20s. So there would actually be in a V configuration, and at the center line of this engine, you would have 22 and a half degrees from center. That would be the center line of the of the left bank, and you'd have 22 and a half degrees off center to the to the center of the uh, right bank. So 22 and a half here, 22 and a half here. That would add up to a total of 45 degrees, and that's the configuration of this engine. Now, so let's talk about what happens during one revolution of this crankshaft. Remember, it's a two-stroke engine, so what that means is that every time the crankshaft makes one revolution, all five, and I said five, elements of the uh, process of the engine operation will occur. So before we go any further, let's talk about them. A lot of times you'll hear in automotive, even in the railroad industry, uh, aviation industry, they'll say that there's four, four different items that take place inside this power assembly. You know, number one, you have injection, or excuse me, number one, you have uh, intake or compress, excuse me, intake. Number two would be compression. Number three would be power and exhaust. So intake, compression, power, and exhaust. However, we're leaving one thing out. In the intake compression, after compression, we're going to put some, we're going to inject some fuel in there between that and power. So it would actually be intake, compression, ignition of that fuel or mixture, power and then exhaust. So that's why I'm saying it's five events. Uh, a lot of people would say it's the four, intake, compression, power, and exhaust. All right, so with that being said, let's talk about what happens. You'll notice that our piston right here is right at the bottom of the air inlet port where it says liner air intake ports. You'll notice that on both sides of this air, uh, air manifold, the piston is right at the bottom of the stroke, but it's also at the widest opening where the maximum amount of air can go from the, the turbocharger to the aftercooler down into the air box and rush in and fill this whole cylinder with fresh air. But you'll notice something. Right up here, the way this is drawn, it shows all four exhaust valves in this engine would be wide open. There's a reason for that. As the piston comes down on the power stroke, what's happening is at a certain point, what we'll see here in a minute, the exhaust valve will begin to open because we already have the inertia of the power stroke happening. And what will happen is as, these, as the piston goes down and the four exhaust valves begin to open, we drop the pressure inside that cylinder rapidly. But before we go with that, any further with that, let's talk about firing pressures inside the cylinder. Well, we talked about intake, compression, ignition, power, and exhaust. Five events that are going to occur. When that fuel air mixture ignites in that cylinder and hammers, that literally drives that piston down, the kind of pressures we're looking at depends on, of course, of the engine, whether it's mechanical unit injection or EFI, electronic fuel injection. But let's just say this is an MUI. Looking inside the cylinder, if we could put a gauge in here, 
it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 2,400 pounds per square inch on top of that piston. A lot of firing pressure, which will definitely move our piston down, which will get our crankshaft to rotate, and that's what we're after right here. So the, the piston comes down, the air comes in, and as, remember, like I mentioned earlier, as the power stroke gets to near the bottom, the exhaust, four exhaust valves open up, and we will begin to draw that combusted air or ignited fuel air mixture, and it'll begin to go out through the open exhaust valves and go out through this turbine wheel in the turbocharger, and it'll actually help drive that. Now, let's take a look here and see what we've got. Oh, a couple other things. When the air is drawn in, now on an EMD turbocharged engine, you need to know this. That turbocharger is gear driven. See, it says to engine gear train. That turbocharger is gear driven up to and including throttle six. So uh, throttle one, two, three, four, five, six, all of that RPM is being driven off the rear gear train of this engine. Once we have enough heat energy built up in throttle notch seven and throttle notch eight, that overriding clutch right here will, will engage and the turbine wheel will actually disengage from the gear train and the impeller and turbine wheel will actually rotate faster than the gear train of the engine. That's when we get our mass, maximum amount of air energy through into here, down into the air, down in the after air ducts where the after cooler is, and then into the air box. Maximum amount of air. Remember, the more fresh air we can pump into this engine, the more horsepower we're going to get out. Speaking of horsepower, you got to remember one thing too, and that is as the air is drawn in here, you'll notice we have this little bitty thing called an after cooler. Well, the purpose of that after cooler is to cool this heated air down. But you ask, well, what's the temperature of that air as it's being drawn in through the air inlet, whether it be gear driven or uh, heat driven? Well, the, let's say the air on average, just for grins, is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. As that air gets compressed one time by this impeller, the temperature of that air will go from 70 degrees to approximately 350 degrees. At 350 degrees, you can bake a cake. The air is very, very hot, and we cannot use that heated air inside this air box. So what we do is we run an, we put an aftercooler where we put water inside it, and all an aftercooler is, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing but a real thick, condensed radiator. And it's, I mean, they're, they're pretty good size, actually. So what will happen is as the air comes down, cooling water, cool, relatively cool, cool water comes into the bottom, goes through all these fins as the air goes through it, and then the, then the water comes up and out here, up into the water return manifold like we talked a couple classes ago. Now, <clears throat> so we got we have nice cool air going in, heated air built up, and as the air goes from about 350 degrees here, by the time it gets inside here and goes to the aftercooler, the temperature will be approximately about 180 degrees, unless we have split cooling, and that's a whole nother class. So we're going to cut that air down, or that air temperature in half at least, as we draw that air through where we can use it. All right. So we've covered all the components. Remember, the injector fires one time for every crankshaft revolution. The exhaust valves open and close on each part assembly in one revolution of that crankshaft. All right, I think I've just about covered everything. We talked about the, the upper portion here. Oh, by the way, this little area right in here is called the oil pan. That's that little winged area there, right there in there. This area right along here represents the oil pan, which we're going to talk about in detail here in a little bit. All right. What we have here is a theory wheel, if you will, and it's going to tell us what happens inside that engine based on number of degrees of rotation of that crankshaft. All right, so we're going to start out at zero degrees, or what we call TDC. TDC is an acronym for top dead center. Okay? So as the crankshaft begins, this, begins to roll down, right, it's going to go from zero degrees, and there, by the way, this flywheel has a pointer. And every 10 degrees, they're, they're marked. And it's actually marked three, all 360 degrees around the flywheel. But at every 10 degrees, you'll see 10, 20, 30, you know, 120, 130, uh, one, you know, 360, you know, 350, 360, that kind of thing. So looking at the pointer, we're going to go ahead and this piston begin from being at the top of the cylinder is now beginning to move down. That's this area right here. Well, what it says right here, at 103 degrees, past top dead center, the exhaust valves will begin to open. Hmm, why would we want the exhaust valves to open? Well, 
We're assuming that we're coming off of a of a power stroke or the five events from the previous revolution up over here. So the reason the exhaust valve is open over here at 103 degrees past top dead center is because there is a lot of combustion gases that are still inside that cylinder that need to be scavenged out. So the exhaust valve is beginning to open and that drops that 2,500 or 2,400 uh, pounds of pressure in there, drops that off really rapidly, okay? So we want to get more, because what we have to do is by the time, before we get to the air intake ports open, the air pressure inside that cylinder has to be equal or actually a little bit less than we have as far as the air intake ports opening. Because if the pressure inside the cylinder is greater than the air intake openings, we'll never get any air feed in there. So we, what we do is we drop the pressure in that cylinder really, really quick. Okay? Then it comes down to here, and you'll notice, exhaust valves open, and it follows all the way around, click over to here, at, at, till, at uh, somewhere after 45 degrees of top dead center, and so it's way over here, exhaust valve closes. Okay? So really from 103 degrees to about 160, 170 degrees, inside that crankshaft rotation, of that one rotation of this crankshaft, the exhaust valves are wide open in this whole area. You can see that right here, demonstrated by this line. Hmm. Interesting, huh? So they're actually open quite a while. Well, we gotta go back over here. So we know where that, that piston and connecting your crankshaft and connecting rod is being pulled down or is actually being fired down, not pulled down, fired down, and it comes down to here at 103 degrees, the exhaust valves, all four of these valves open up. We start to get rid of that air pressure real quick, and the exhaust valves stay open, stay open. And at, uh, let's see, right here, we have 45 degrees past the 103 degrees, so that's almost 160 degrees past the uh, top dead center. The air intake port's open. And what'll happen is that means that piston has gone down far enough where the air inlet opening will be wide open. So the air inlet or air ports open, air intake ports open, air ports are completely open right in this range here. So if you look right here, from here to here, the piston is coming down. And remember, when that top ring clears, we are getting a fresh air from the airbox actually flowing inside this cylinder right here. So right here at 45 degrees, right from, from the, air, the air intake ports open, they stay open, they stay open for a total amount of 90 degrees in this area right here. So actually, if you think about it, the air intake ports stay open quite a while too. Well, there's two reasons why we have the air intake ports open that long. Now you gotta remember, the air intake ports are not movable. They are just openings inside the liner. Okay, so for that 90 degrees of crankshaft rotation from here over to here, two things are happening. Number one, we are scavenging the spent or, or used combustion from that previous cycle. Remember, we want a clean, fresh air as much as we can. So the exhaust valves, like I said, stay open quite a bit of time to scavenge out all, that, that, all those uh, spent fuel air mixture. And that's a good thing. As the as these as the exhaust valves come over here and close, what will happen is there's enough air from the air box that will now rush into here, and we will have this before the air before the exhaust valve closes, and the piston comes up and blocks off these two ports here. I now have fresh air inside that cylinder. Not all the scavenged exhaust gases are gone. I now have nothing but fresh air inside that cylinder. Once I get, and by the way, this BDC is bottom dead center. So, you know, 45 degrees before bottom dead center, the air ports are opening. Okay, 45 degrees after, the air intake ports are going to close. So, piston comes down, we scavenge the exhaust gases out. As we get over to here, the intake ports close. And, and just a little bit past that, just a little bit, we're going to close the exhaust valves and we're going to have, once, we, once that piston gets past these ports, we now have a captive amount of air that we're going to compress in a large manner, okay? So once, and all we've done here, ladies and gentlemen, is we've, we've brought, brought the engine over, I rotated the crankshaft, 103 degrees, the exhaust valves open, you know, and then we come down here and for where our bottom dead center is, 45 degrees before it, the air intake ports open, and at right in the middle of 45 degrees, which would be about to, you know, uh, 22 and a half degrees, what will happen is these airports are fully wide open. Massive amount of air is going in, being packed into the cylinder. 
and then the exhaust valves are still open over here. Remember, they open over there, and they say clear open, clear over here. I now have fresh air. The exhaust valves close right here. Uh, and air intake ports close. Remember, my exhaust valves are still open, so any traces of combustion will not be evacuated out of here. <coughs> and then once I get 45 degrees, actually 61 degrees past top dead center, then I'm going to close the exhaust valves. Then from here all the way up to here, I'm compressing the air. Now, we've just said a whole bunch of stuff, haven't we? Okay, but here's the cool part. From here all the way up to here, all we're doing is we're compressing the air. When we compress the air, we heat up the molecules. The molecules get really, really hot. Okay, so about four degrees before top dead center, the injector is going to begin injection. We're going to start pumping a little bit of fuel, a very metered amount, into that top of that piston. Okay, and that piston is what they call a quiescent dome. I don't even know what quiescent is, but it's shaped bowl shaped like so when that injector fires in a 360 degree pattern, it comes up and swirls up. Kind of cool. So right here at zero degrees, fuel injection ends. Right now I have that fuel air mixture igniting, and guess what that piston is going to start doing once it gets past zero degrees? It's going to start to power stroke, and it's going to do it all over again and again and again. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's really quite simple. Exhaust valves open, intake ports open, air in the port is over a lot. We're getting scavenging all the exhaust out of there. We're at bottom dead center. Fresh air is still pouring into the cylinder. Uh, the exhaust valves still stay open. Uh, the air inlet ports close, and then the, finally the exhaust valves close. Then we compress that new charge of fresh air. We ignite it. We start the whole circuit all over again. Um, let's talk a little bit about oil pans and usable oil. Now we mentioned that in the last video about a, a basic pan and then also an increased capacity. So let's take a look at it again real quick. Basic oil pan is right here. It has about 50 to 60 gallons of usable oil in the pan. We're going to talk about what that means. Here, if you look at this newer engine, it has an increased capacity. Big, big difference in how much engine oil can be held in each oil pan. Now, with that being said, I'm going to concentrate on this one more than this one because it's amazing. What, well, actually, what both of them are going to do. This one has about, like I said, about 50, 60 gallons of usable oil. This one has 150 gallons of usable oil. But before we go any further, let's go to the next slide for just a second. I want to ask you a question. We're going to come back to usable oil. But let me ask you a question. What happens to the oil level in the EMD two-stroke engine as a locomotive goes down the track? Well, here's my diesel engine. Here's my oil pan. My oil level is in here. This particular engine holds about, eh, about 395 gallons of engine oil. And of that, let's just round it off for 400 for easy calculation. If I have 150 gallons of usable oil, that means I've got 250 gallons of oil that I can use without providing any harm to my engine. Hmm. Let's go on a little further. But before we go on, you got to remember, as an EMD engine moves down the track, the oil level is going to drop all by itself. Now, if you're working in the railroad industry, you're going to notice that all the time, that every time, you, or not every time, but a lot of times, when an EMD comes in for servicing, the oil level will be, will be low or lower. Hmm. Why is that? Well, as the engine's going down the track, that oil is being consumed by the engine. Hmm. Interesting. You got to remember, this engine will lose five gallons of lube oil for every 1,000 gallons of diesel fuel burned. That's five gallons of lube oil for every 1,000 gallons of diesel fuel burned. So, as the locomotive is going down the track, the oil level is dropping. That is a natural characteristic of this engine. There's nothing wrong. But if you're working on the railroad, you need to know that when that locomotive comes in, you need to check the oil level accurately. And before that locomotive leaves the service area, you need to make sure the oil level is on the full mark. Remember, we don't want it too low. We don't want it too high. We want it on the full mark. All right. Go ahead. What was that rate again? Five gallons of oil for 1,000 gallons of diesel fuel burned. Okay, what is the purpose of the oil pan dipstick? I just happen to have one right there and you can't see it very well, but it's like the dipstick in your car, okay? It has a low line and it has a full line or, or a full line and an add line, whichever way you want to go. Same thing with your automobile. Now, this on all these EMD engines, there's a dipstick on the right side of the engine because this is what we're showing. There's also one on the other side called on the left bank. 
So there's usually two dipsticks per locomotive. Now, what is the purpose of the oil pan dipstick? Well, remember we talked about usable oil? Where it says full and then it has add? Well, on a basic pan, that would be about 50, 60 gallons of oil. Okay? That determines that. What about, let's go back for just a second to the increased capacity. Well, I want to show you something here. Down in here, you don't think that's even better. So I got about 50 to 60 gallons of usable oil. This one here, I have 150 gallons of usable oil. So as the engine's going down the track, this engine can stay out much longer than this one because it has a lot more oil that it can use. Usable oil means oil consumed in this engine that will stay somewhere between the full mark and the add mark without causing any harm to this diesel engine or this diesel engine. Okay, let's go. We've already talked about that. We talked about the dipstick. Let's move on. All right, well, again, we've already talked about what has been the full and add marks. Here's the cool part. Let's go to the next one. I'm going to show you something. How many gallons of oil are there for every inch of, on the dipstick? Well, if I have an increased capacity pan, I'm going to have about 10 inches of usable oil. That means if I take the, the, the theory of, well, let's see. How many gallons of oil are there for every inch of the dipstick? The answer is approximately 18 gallons. So if I have a 10 inch range, what's 10 times 18? That's 180 gallons of oil between that full mark and the add mark. So we have to ask ourselves the question, where is this oil going? Well, let's go to the next slide. What is usable oil? Remember I mentioned earlier, usable oil is oil that is burned or consumed in the engine. But wait a minute, we gotta figure that out. Let's go to the next slide. Right. So here we have a power assembly. We have a, a, a cylinder, we have a, we have a piston. And what happens as this piston's going up and down, air inside the air box is swirling around this whole power assembly. The air hits the oil molecules and the oil molecules become airborne inside the air box. So what I have inside here is an oily vaporous air mass, okay? So what'll happen is as that piston comes down, like we mentioned earlier, and it's gonna drop that piston down below the port, that oily air is gonna rush into that power assembly and go up inside there. So what's gonna happen is, once we get all the, all the uh, spent fuel and vapors out of there, and we get this filling to charge up with fresh air, some of that air that's going in there will contain engine oil. And remember, this is one times 16, okay? So what will happen is, is I'm actually going to start consuming air. So when I get the ignition inside the cylinder, I'm actually burning three things. I'm burning air, I'm burning diesel fuel, and I'm burning engine oil. A lot of people aren't aware of that, but you burn three things. And remember, like I mentioned earlier, as this piston's going up and down, it's also doing what? It's rotating. So it's turning, okay? All right, so now we know where the engine is going and how it got there and why it's doing it. So let's go to the very last slide and let's take a look at it. You'll notice where it says, where does the carbon come from? You know, most times you look inside this air box and you're gonna see a large amount of carbon or even a light coating of carbon, okay? Well, where does that carbon come from? Again, it's a natural byproduct of the operation of this engine. When that piston comes down, remember we talked about lowering the, the pressure inside the cylinder to become less than that of the airbox? Well, normally, let's say on, on the 710 engine, I got, say, 35, 40 pounds of airbox pressure. What will happen is, by the time that top ring clears that port, I'll have just a few pounds of pressure for just a millisecond more than I have in the, in, out here. And what will happen is, is those carb, the, the, is the, uh, the elements of combustion, carbon, unburnt fuel, will actually puff back into the air box. Just momentarily, it doesn't hurt anything, but what it does, it actually takes combustion gases and they flow into the air box, just briefly, just like a millisecond, then the piston comes down, air, flow, air, air rushes in, pressure gets greater in the air box than in here, and all the, all the exhaust gases go out. But that little bit of puff back is why we have all that carbon that floats around and adheres to everything. So, we took a big bite today, a uh, lot of good stuff. Again, we want you to go to our website, take a look at it. We're offering two classes currently, a basic air brake class, five days long, and also a FRA class, which is two days long. So, go to it, take a look at it, give us a call. Our web address is lst-ca.com. Once again, it's lst-ca.com. Thank you and have a safe week.